All right, five, four, three, two. One. Welcome to Radio Corona. I'm Jennifer Strong, Senior Editor for Audio and Live Journalism. Pleased to be standing in for our Editor in Chief, Gideon Litchfield. He'll be back with you on Thursday. All of us at Tech Review know there are really many ways you could choose to invest your time during this difficult period. So thank you for choosing to spend a bit of it with us. For the next half hour, we're going to be looking at the economy, which, like so much else right now, may be unknowable, and yet requires an incredible amount of planning and leadership. How do we reopen the economy, and what does that even mean? Here to share some ideas on those questions and so many more, I am delighted to welcome economist John Van Rienen. He's in London, he's a professor of applied economics at MIT, and he's a member of the MIT Task Force on Work of the Future. Welcome, John. Hi, Jennifer. Nice to be here. Thank you. So I, I realize we have many more questions and answers, but when the time comes, how do we begin to revive and reopen global economy? Well, I mean, I, I think the first thing to, to to think about is that it's what's really important at this time is actually to listen to the medics and the medical experts more than the economists. And I say that as an economist, um, because, you know, what is the most important thing in the in the as, as is happening in the short run all over the world is to safeguard people's lives and, and, and well-being. Um, you know, often you hear people say it's the economy versus health, but that's a false, a false juxtaposition because really, you know, the economy is there to serve people. People are not there to serve the economy. So the most important thing is to listen to the medics and listen to the messages about how we keep ourselves safe through, as we've been doing, you know, strong containment, strong suppression, to get the virus under control. Now, going forward to your question, you know, we've got to think about as we start, uh, as we're starting to do to bring it under control, and hopefully, you know, the horrendous numbers start plateauing and going down. How do we then start planning the moving out of the lockdown period? Um, what we have to be really careful about, obviously, is not to do it too quickly. The last thing we want is to you know, have a, you know, a second wave of the of the virus taking people's lives and taking people's well-beings away. So we have to do several things. So you know, first of all, you know, to do this um, uh, moving out of the lockdown, to do it incrementally, to do it slowly. And so you know, it's important as we do that to monitor what's going on, to monitor if there's a you know increase in the infection rates. Um, and you know, to do that, you know, the number one important thing I think there is to have much stronger te a testing regime than we have at the moment. So I mean, that's actually also the key to keeping it under control. Um, and at the moment, as you know, as my co-author and friend Paul Romer has pointed out, you know, we've really failed to do enough, invest enough capacity in testing people. Um, and in particular, I mean, there's two types of testing, as you know. I mean, one is the testing to see whether you have the coronavirus, um, and the other is the testing to see whether the antibodies, you know, after you after you've recovered from it. And the first type actually is the most important because, as we know, so many people can be walking around not having symptoms and yet be um, potentially carrying it. So, what's super important is to have ways of testing people. Um, you know, this has to be a large fraction of the US population. So Paul reckons maybe 7% random testing has to be there. So if you can test people, you can then see whether it's safe for them to, you know, rejoin the rejoin the workforce, rejoin the economy. You know, and even if those tests are imperfect, which they are, you know, you're going to get some false negatives. At least, um, you know, if you know someone or you have a strong suspicion someone from the test is testing positive, you can, they can self-isolate, that will manage to keep it under control, and then you can actually ena enable them more safely to actually rejoin the economy. So I think that is the most, testing is the most important thing. Now, of course, even with the testing that we, we have, and you know, there's lots of improvements in the speed of that, which has to be put forward, um, what we'll do will be constrained. So we'll have to start relaxing 
different places at different times. So, you know, some places which are, you know, strong hotspots, um, we won't want to relax that so quickly. Other places where things have been brought more under control, we can afford to, you know, to start relaxing things that are more. Secondly, we'll do it for different occupations. So, you know, what we want to do is to kind of get uh, key workers working going beyond health and doing that again gradually. So I think it's going to be this gradual process in order to monitor um, what happens as we relax this in order to make sure we don't have a, you know, uh, re, you know go back to the same problems that we're having having right now. So I think that is the kind of key key elements of the, of the package we need. For, for sure. But I'm also curious from where you sit, what role does government driving of innovation have when the time comes and restarting the economy? And do you feel this might be an opportunity for a rethinking of industrial policy? Um, so th there's lots of aspects to that question. So I mean, I mean, one, you know, I was really disappointed, that, you know, in the, um, you know, the the, the so-called the so-called stimulus, uh, you know, two trillion package was actually is not. It's like a disaster relief for after the stimulus because what we're trying to do is not to stimulate people to the economy at this point. But I, I think a much larger amount of money on that should have gone into um, innovation for improving testing. I mean, this is testing is one thing where. You know, it's a, a form of IT where we get very rapid improvements. So that's a very narrow thing, but super important in the short and, and medium run. Um, in, in, the, in the longer run, um, as we've seen, you know, many people and many firms are responding to the challenge by innovating, by coming up with different ways of doing the business differently and working differently. So, you know, one of the interesting things is that um, many of the ways that, uh, we thought that we would start working so like we're doing right now you know interacting at a distance um, delivering education online education over zoom um, having meetings um, you know over over different platforms you know those type of things people have been talking about for a long time the death of distance and yet in fact although these technologies have come around you know, they still haven't led to the death of distance there's still a lot of interaction so i think that one of the interesting ways in which we'll, 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 we'll see things develop will be much greater use of these technologies and big changes in, in the kind of way that we work. On the bigger picture question, you, know, you mentioned it, you know, industrial policy. I think one of the really fascinating questions as we come out of this you know, horrific time is whether it, there will be fundamental changes made to the way that governments and the state interacts with the rest of the economy. So, you know, one of the, you know, key features of the global pandemic has been it's revealed the very different degrees of state capacities in different countries. So some countries have been able to respond much more effectively to the crisis, intervening earlier, testing, monitoring, managing under control than other countries have. And so, you know, and the economy now, you know, is dominated by the government. You know, the government is, you know, in most countries basically running the show. So the interesting question is, when um, we, things start returning to normal, will we just go back to business as usual? Or will, in fact, we see that um, there's a, you know, people are keener on a much bigger role for the state in, uh, you know, in, in, in managing the economy? Um, and I don't think we know the answer to that. I think that it can go both, it can go both ways. I suspect there will be um, a greater emphasis on industrial policy, on intervention. People will um, see a bigger role for the state because they've seen that you know the state state's capacity is absolutely critical towards dealing with the kind of uh, kind of crises that we're, we're living under right now. An analogy would be to what happens in wars. I mean, in a way, it's a kind of war-like wartime situation, a huge crisis. People have had to um, live in different ways. You know, many ways people have come to realize that many services like health services, garbage collection, thing, you know, things which weren't given uh, enough prestige now are given a lot of prestige. Um, and I think you know, there may be a, a, a cultural shift in society, which means that we give um, more emphasis to those things, uh, which means we decide to actually tackle some of the fundamental problems which um, we've seen over the last few decades, such as the, 
you know, very rapid increase of inequality, the dysfunctional political system, the increased polarization. Maybe, you know, an optimistic story is it will lead us to tackle those uh, pessimistic possibilities. It does the opposite. And we retreat back into nationalism, you know, and, you know, start blaming each, each other for the problems we're in. And that's, and that's another, you know, yeah. as people, when people are afraid, that's another possibility. So, you know, but it opens up I think the possibility for much more radical change than we've seen in the, in the past. I'm curious, have countries with stronger industrial policies or controls fared better? I mean, I know it's probably too soon to tell, but what lessons have we learned? Well, I mean, of course, there's a, you know, the word industrial policy means very different things to different people. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard to generalize. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, the one contrast which does seem clear would be say between some countries in east asia china singapore hong kong taiwan south korea those countries seem to have been um quite effective in controlling the virus early or in china's case you know intervening you know aggressively later to get it back under control now of course china kept you know is in part to blame because they kept it secret for a while and you know so it's not a not a you know it's not a, a it's a very bad that was a very you know undesirable bad thing but you know they themselves actually were quite aggressive in managing to lock things down and pull the numbers down you know and those the, all those countries most of those countries have industrial policies have um you know an important role for the states in in in, in society but then if you look and say in, in you know in, in other western countries like the united states and parts of europe even there you see quite different responses um so for example um you know my own you know, countries like the uk and the us have been quite s relatively slow to react whereas other countries like you know denmark um have been you know very fast to to respond um so and i don't think you know you wouldn't say that you know Den you know Denmark or Austria have a particular stronger industrial policy than the UK or the US. I mean, there's more state intervention in those economies, but I, so I, I think it's um, at the moment. You know, we, we, of course, we still have to see how things progress over time before we judge countries being successful or not. But at the moment, the, the kind of factors which I see is really important as you know one is in some sense trust in this in the state and the government to respond so you know are, are people listening to what the government says they're responding to what the government says secondly the health system so you know the app the, the, the really important thing in managing the coronavirus is you know this this whole you know this this now well-known phrase flattening the curve so to try and keep the numbers of people infected and going into hospital down um, so that the health system has the capacity to handle that load going through. And countries which have managed to handle things better have been those countries which have better functioning health systems and more health capacity. So Germany, for example, uh, has, has had a lot of, um, you know, some people before the crisis were saying too much excess capacity in healthcare, but because they had so many more ICU beds, because they've had so many more doctors and nurses, they've been able to cope much better with the increase of the infected rate. So I think the infection rate, the number of people infected has been, you know, you know, not not very low in Germany, but the death rate has been extremely low. I think part of that has been because of the, the better health system. And the third thing has been the, the way that, you know, some countries have been much better at monitoring and testing people who have coronavirus, doing contact tracing like they did in South Korea, very effectively and in China and in Germany as well, in order to you know find out who has it, get them to go into self isolation. Um, that requires a combination of you know strong strong state capacity, good use of technology, so you can use mobile phones, and other technologies to track where people are, and also some degree of trust. You know if you you know if you don't trust the government at all, <laughs> then you know you won't be prepared to allow, enable them to share the information that they need to have in order to respond. So I think those are the you know so technology is really important, but my sense is those are the you know three of the really important things in terms of you know determining which countries have, have responded better or worse. But you know 
jury is still out, right? So there's a lot, we have a long way to go before we really know what, what works and what doesn't work. What, one lesson we can take from history actually is interesting. So, you know, one of my, some of my MIT colleagues published a super interesting paper on looking what happened during the, you know, 1918 flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if, if you remember, like that was, you know, probably the closest uh, to what we're experiencing now in terms of a global pandemic. 2% of the world's population died between uh, 1918 and 1920 because of the Spanish flu, I understand. And, and uh, the, you know, these, um, what, what, the, what the, uh, the, the, the researchers did was they looked in the US across different cities and different cities responded in quite, with quite different policies to the pandemic. So some cities were, were quite aggressive, you know, closed down taverns and pool halls and meeting places. Uh, others were much slower, much more you know, relaxed about things. And what the researchers did was they kind of then followed to see what happened to the number of people dying of Spanish flu and the economy. And the really interesting thing is that unsurprisingly, maybe the places which responded more aggressively, there was less deaths, but perhaps more interestingly, the place that responded aggressively a year or two later actually were economically more successful. So it wasn't that, you know, they traded off a worse economic outcome um, for a better, you know, for, for better health outcomes. The two went together. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the lessons from that is that you know, early action to suppress the, the, the virus actually can be both good for the economy and also good, good for health. Now, of course, the Spanish flu is not the same as the coronavirus. You know, it, the flu affected able-bodied people um, as much as it did older people. I understand. So, you know, you can you can, you can see that if you if you act to reduce the um, you know the, the infection rates for able-bodied people, then that has a bigger economic effect. But still, I think you know that the the lessons of that are relevant today in terms of thinking about what's more successful, what's not successful. Kind of early aggressive in intervention can be very effective in uh, helping both health and the economy. Absolutely. My colleague, David Rotman, actually has a piece that's up at techreview.com that explores this a little more deeply. Um, before we go any further, I'd like to take a few audience questions. But for those of you who are just tuning in, this is Radio Corona from MIT Technology Review. I'm Jennifer Strong, and I'm joined by MIT economist John Van Rena. So. Let's see. First up, we have one that says, quote, I worry that in their rush to justify reopening the economy, our administration may discount the widely accepted value. And I assume this is a question from the United States. It doesn't say of a statistical life. That's because older people and people of color are more likely to die during this pandemic. So, John, how much flexibility could this administration be given when selecting that value? Well, just to, you know, for people who are not necessarily, you know, familiar with this concept of statistical value, you know, but for, for many people, they find this idea, you know, abhorrent that you could put a value on, on, on human life. It sounds, you know, terrible. But, you know, in, in fact, it's quite a useful thing to do because we make both as individuals and as governments these decisions all the time. You know, we decide to build a, a new highway so we can get from you know, point A to point B quicker, but more people are going to die from the highway, it's going to cause more pollution. So, you know, in terms of managing that trade-off between economic benefit and risk, there's this concept of a kind of statistical life which tries to capture that trade-off between the you know, convenience of, of doing things and the kind of cost potentially in terms of human life. And in the context of the, the coronavirus, um, the, the, you know, as we come out of the, the crisis phase, that's the kind of trade-off we're making. We're kind of maybe risking some more people's lives, but the benefit is that, you know, we're going to create more wealth for the economy as a whole. Now, the fact is the kind of values of the people like the eat the environmental protection agency has a value of about $10 million on, on, on a statistical life. And, you know, given the scale of the coronavirus, that suggests, you know, this aggressive lockdown is exactly the right thing to do because, even if you know if you just calculate the numbers you know you would spend trillions and trillions and trillions you know, i think um, one Ch chicago economist uh, has estimated you spend you could spend seven trillion dollars if you were to in order to uh, tackle the coronavirus so i think on average you know we're doing the right thing now there is you know, do you are we undervaluing um um minorities or, or older people i mean the 
you know, I, I don't think because of the, that calculation I just made, you know, having having an aggressive lockdown is the right policy to do. Um, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think that as we think about relaxing it, people are should be underestimating the importance of, of, of seniors in, in this in this, this calculation. I do, I do though share the um, the listeners' concern that the administration is seems to want to move too quickly through opening the economy. There does seem to be this this desire to, you know, uh, what was that phrase, avoid killing the economy. But I, I think that that really is a misguided re, you know, attitude because as I said, you know, all the calculations suggest we should be doing what we're doing, you know, aggressive action, um, not just save lives, but is long-term good for the economy. Um, and, you know, I think that we should not rush too quickly to reopening it. Um, and therefore risking, you know, even greater damage than we are now. Mm -hmm. So going forward, I'm curious, how do you suppose the economy might look different as it recovers? And also separately, do you think the gig economy will survive this? Um, well, you know, I, the, the IMF produced a report today suggesting that the U.S. was going to shrink, its GDP would shrink by about 6% this year, 5.9%. Uh, I think that's probably right. I think even as we relax things, people won't change their behavior so quickly because they'll be scared about what's going to happen. So I think, you know, there will be a lot of changes in the, in, in the medium run with people being very uncertain, um, being more cautious, saving more, going out less. So I, I don't think there'll be a you know, sudden reversal. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, we will see very big changes to the way we work and the way that we do things. I think the service economy is going to, is, you know, it's taken a huge hit, will continue to take a hit because people have been a fear, a fear of interacting as much as they do. There'll be a lot more the movement towards social interaction online and that type of interaction will continue. So I think there's almost going to be a bigger effect on services than there will be in manufacturing. As the gig economy, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I, there's, there's different forces. I think on the one hand, you know, uh, you know, people are going out less to restaurants, but ordering more things from Uber Eats, uh, going less out to movie theaters and, you know, watching more Netflix. Um, they're going to uh, maybe, I guess, uh, I mean, like maybe using Uber less because of that, that part of the gig economy may suffer. Other parts of the gig economy because of, you know, on, you know delivery services, that, that will probably continue to thrive. Um, I think that one, one interesting aspect will be you know, we know that all recessions affect, um, you know, poor people, less skilled people, worse than they do wealthier people. You know, and we've seen this very strongly in this pandemic. So, you know, rel you know, relatively uh, well-off people can you know, find it easier to work from home. They have savings to cushion the blow. Poorer groups don't have that, you know, insurance. You know, don't have that insurance, or often they don't have health insurance, so they may be scared to get the right treatments. So, I, I think that. Um, you know, the inequalities are already there come into much sharper relief with uh, what's happened with the pandemic. And that might lead to much greater demands for stronger labor standards, for greater protection, um, and you know, even for, you know, for people in the gig economy as well. And that might actually reduce some of the, um, some of the size of the gig economy from this kind of political, political mechanism. You know, but my, my overall sense is that, you know, with more working from home or distance working, I think unless, you know, if there's not labor standards or big political changes, then I think you know, the gig economy will continue alive and well after the pandemic ends. We have another listener question here, and that is, what road should developing economy take in the short to medium term and the overall in the long term? Do you have thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's interesting that the, um, you know, the, the, the richer countries have almost felt a, a bigger wave of the pandemic first. Uh, China, you know, is an emerging economy and, and, and the United States and Europe. But, you know, as we're seeing now, more and more developing countries are being hit, particularly India. I mean, India is, is facing this huge challenge. And the, you know, the number one challenge, like it is in the West, but it's going to be much worse in developing countries, is the healthcare system. So the healthcare systems of developing countries are much more fragile and less well-funded than the richer countries. So the, the, just like the West, the key, the key thing is gonna be somehow um, trying to have 
self-isolation, social distancing, to enable the health system to function as best they can. Because I think, you know, as, as we're seeing here, you know, even, you know, New York City, where, you know, where you are, right? you know, their health system there is on the ground. So imagine what it's going to be like in, in Delhi um, or, in, uh, or in Jaipur or in places in, in, in Malaysia and Indonesia and in Africa. Those are going to be, so I think the healthcare system, um, to, you know, protecting that, you know, there's a role that, the, you know, the West can obviously play in, and the rich countries can play in that as well. Um, I think that, um, the, you know, there's the movement that we've already seen towards helping these countries uh, deal with the debts that they, the debts they face, having some kind of debt forgiveness and uh, greater support to help them. You, you know, one of the key things we've had to do in the United States and, and in Europe is to, um, you know, we've put the economy into a coma um, and to keep people alive, we've kind of pumped them full of very, you know, trillions of dollars and euros of, you know, very strong chemicals, you know, which is great is exactly what we need to do you know money you know, money, you know, we, you know the worst thing that can happen is if, if people lose their jobs and get disconnected from the labor market or good businesses go out of business but developing countries don't have that luxury they don't have the same amount of resources so you know we have to think of ways in which we can kind of channel resources to them to kind of help them get through this very difficult period so they've got some bre some slight breathing space but um, that's going to be just going to change very rapidly over the course of the next month or so. Cool. Do you have any other thoughts on what's going to happen Could you just say that again, Jennifer? You cut out a little bit. As we move forward here and hopefully move into the recovery, do you have any other just general thoughts on what's going to happen with productivity and security? Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> The 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 the, cha the challenge is, of course, but, you know, even to the, the world has been in this kind of pro pro slow productivity period since the global financial crisis. In fact, you know, even since the uh, you know, the mid seventies oil shocks. So, the you know we've had sluggish productivity growth, which is surprising given all the innovations that you know you see walking around MIT or Silicon Valley. But the fact is, in the numbers, we've had this kind of productivity slowdown, and you know the the pandemic is as it obviously made it worse in the short run and you know may also make it worse as we come out if people are reluctant to invest and spend money so i you know i was already saying before the um the pandemic you know in the, in the united states and europe we need to move towards you know addressing that productivity problem in my view is that the only way we the main way we get out of that is innovation so having, uh, you know, we used to in the US spend about uh, just below 2% of um, our, our, our gross domestic product on federally funded research. And now that's gone down to like 0.7%, you know, before the pandemic. So, you know, what the, you know, the main way that we um, improve productivity in, a, in an advanced society like the US or like Europe is through more innovation. So we have to think of how we can put, you know, significant resources into rebuilding our innovative capacity and you know i think that we have loads of loads of ideas we have great strengths um but we need to put resources in order to do that because if we don't then we're never going to really uh, get out of this productivity race. so i hope the pandemic galvanizes people into thinking that we really need to you know reinvigorate um the economies in the west to get out of this low productivity malaise and go you know start really putting resources into innovation again rather than consumption sure. although um what about those things survive in a way that's recognizable or perhaps be fundamentally rethought sorry say, say that again I'm curious about your thoughts on global supply chains oh global supply chains yeah no that's a very important issue that's not really discussed enough so you know with you know globalization people think of this and trade and people with movement but you know there is this you know, the way that um, manufactured goods have worked increasingly being spread all over the world and that's led to big efficiencies you know producing some parts in china and some parts in europe and assembling them and in, you know in other parts of the world but you know the pandemic has really shown how fragile they are because you break one link of that and you can bring down the, the entire supply chain. So I think it's quite likely that we'll see those type of models of global su supply chains being you know, reimagined. So I think there will be you know, more insuring and less offshoring. 
uh, than there has been in the past that um, we'll have to think a lot about how to make them more resilient so you know there's you know if one part goes down there's an option to try and get the supply chain from somewhere else but i think there's an opportunity as well because what we're learning about global supply chains i mean and my colleague there has, has written a lot on this is that you know, you know when you have these chains you know you get these amplification mechanisms so you have you know if one part of the chain is, is affected it can reverberate around all the rest of the chain so that means that if you can kind of isolate where those weaknesses are you can do more to protect them so you can think about ways of making interventions to protect the most vulnerable parts of the supply chain in order to uh, help the recovery happen more quickly um, and you know there's lots of different ways to do that by looking at the production flows or the, the service flows but the, i think you know the recognition of that means that you know when we think about the right way to do policy interventions and we have to really think about how we can manage these supply chains better than we previously did and, and realize that they're much more vulnerable than we may have thought to these type of um, these pandemics and other catastrophes. And folks, we have to leave it there as we're out of time. Thank you very much, John. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and uh, for everybody who was listening in. So uh, if, you, you know, be if, you, if you have any more questions for me, then just uh, ping me an email, vanarine at mit.edu. And thank you, folks. If you'd like more on the topic of economic recovery, please do join us again on Thursday at 4 o'clock Eastern Time at Springfield Pacific. Our editor-in-chief, Gideon Whitfield, is back with special guest Nelson and Mark. They'll be comparing Eastern economies to Western economies and discussing what we can learn from China's movement. I hope you and yours are safe and well during these difficult times. Take care. Thank you.